Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. This time we're going to dive into uh, reassemblers again, uh, but first let me just point this out. So, uh, there has been complaints that the uh, loading picture of the game Fairlight, which is what you see in the background, that I previously used, was the Spectrum version. To be honest, I think it's the correct one with a bit of oversaturated colors, so it looks Spectrum. I've taken another frame grab of it, and uh, this is using another palette. And uh, yeah, so it's the same picture. I took the screen grab on the previous one, and this screen grab I've also taken from loading picture from the Computer Brains version of the game, actually. Well, anyways, uh, you haters will always hate, but this is the correct one, and I hope you like the palette better with this one. Let's dive into the topic of today, so reassemblers. I've had a previous uh, episode where I discussed reassemblers, and the point of that one was uh, regenerator. Now we're going to look at something which is in active development. It's uh, also kind of uh, more modern looking and modern working. Uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing always, but it has its clear merits. This is 6502 Bench. Um, it's coded by a guy called Andy Mc McFadden. And um, it's sort of 6502 uh, it's supporting 6502, but it's rather agnostic to the platform, which makes it sort of different compared to something like Regenerator, which is very sort of C64 centric. But let's have a look. All right, so welcome back. So we'll have a look at uh, what 6502 Bench is doing here. Um, first of all, the guy, Andy McFadden, he is I would say predominantly focusing on, on, on Nintendo, so his 6502 is basically coming from uh, reassembling Nintendo stuff, but it's the same 6502, so the, the disassembly or the reassembly would work basically the same, but there are of course a few, few special aspects of each platform. So, uh, on the C64, a program file, that's a native file system uh, or, or file format that has the load address in the beginning. That's seemingly not the, the normal case in, in Nintendo, it's, uh, because his normal assumption is the fact that you just load a binary piece and then you need to define stuff. So he basically sees that as metadata. Uh, and I will not bring this conflict or, or discussion I had with him, but the way he treats it is like he, he extracts the first two bytes and has a special handling for them as if they were two bytes added, like metadata added to the file. And, and uh, for me, this is sort of weird. Uh, because you could just set the org as per this and you would be done. But uh, yeah, let's let's skip that discussion. Uh, I, Andy has done a great program and I shouldn't complain about this very special aspect where we sort of disagree. Uh, he is trying to parse the file assuming it's um, not assuming anything. Uh, so, but what he has found here is that the start address is also the, the the start address of the file is also sort of the start of execution. And what his program is doing is from uh, the start of execution, where you set an execution point, he parses the entire uh, operation of that program, tries to traverse all the instruction and doing a brilliant job at it. So it's not like you set a start and, and a finish and define that as code, as code. If you do that, you would, you would cause the problem, a number of problems for the program. You just set the first address and then you set this is code and then that traverses. Uh, and it's done that a bit of that already. And I will now help you with a, a bit of special uh, and, and quite difficult to find in the manual kind of UI pick, uh, stuff. You double click here on the JMP so for jumping to this address. So here you suddenly see that you have jumped here 
and the program gives you a bit of background of this what this is and it also gives you reference so this address is referenced from here so if you want to go back to where it's referenced from you just double click there and you're back to this jump okay um, okay and and one of the other things this program is doing really well is um, handling the let's say logical program counter uh, in the program you could have blocks that would be it's it's placed in one place in memory and then it's copied somewhere else and executed in the new location and this is a very special case of that so uh, it here it takes a chunk of memory from OA12 uh, and copy that to O2A7. And then it takes another block from another uh, area here and copy it to O340. And we will uh, do this. So I can double click here and we I should also count. It's, it's 59 bytes from there. So here, 59 bytes here, that will be 6 uh ab o o eight a o a a b isn't it uh no it should be o eight six b of course yes like that uh so you what i do now is set an address for this go to a7 because we know that that is where it's going and suddenly you see that here is a jump to o2 a7 and because there it has done analysis of the code and found that there is a reference to o2 a7 uh, a jump so program counter will at one point in time come here and then it parsed this as uh, as code and i didn't need to do anything just tell it that this is a block that goes there I should, uh, let's see where that was, and uh, I, I don't know where, how to trace that back, so let's do it like this, and here is the other block, and we will do, so this one goes to, oh, hmm, how long was that block, it was 31 bytes, so that would be to, oh, a 9c, would that be? A nine C um, should be nine B, right? Uh, I'm, I'm only doing it like that. So, and that will be setting the address to O three forty. All right. So, scrolling up again. So, it copied this, and uh, yeah, now that address has become absolute, and I don't know how to handle that, but uh, I have an ongoing discussion on that. So, eventually, I might learn how to do it properly. And uh, what happened here is now this has become an absolute address, and this has become a relative one. But okay, uh, let's see what else this thing is doing here. Here it's copying something to screen memory and uh, what you do here is uh, I can do it either pressing Control O or I can do right click and select operand. So I want to add a symbol here. Screen mem. Okay, so what happened now here is that 0400 is defined as screen memory. This is part of the program, and there is already a, a label generated for this, but this is something that eventually will end up in screen memory. So if we do it like this, uh, I can do, and there is no defined label for it. it there is sort of an, an automatically generated one, but this is screen mem data. Screen mem data, yeah, like that. And I can do this for uh, it's called mem data. So that's stuff that will be copied to D800. Uh, control call mem. That was the actual address D800. Okay. Yeah. See now that I'm just going to double check that there is something called a three 
Well, yeah. Hmm. It didn't stop here. Okay, this has now turned back to 089C. So this is good. This is, and this is all data. Um, this is actually code. So I should set a label here and I will show you why I do this. Uh, because here you have a reference to that particular point. And the way you do it is, again, you're doing this and a symbol and this is the low part of that. And this is the high version of that. So here you set the low byte and high byte into the NMI vector and uh, and point them to this particular point. So uh, and this is actually code. Uh, so what you do is you set the code the address as a code start point. So yeah, it's it's a very short piece of code because it's only doing a return from interrupt. Uh, but there you see that that is a way where you need to. You, you need to outsmart the logic by, by guiding the logic that this is actually code as well. And the, you know that because the NMI vectors uh, are pointing there, or the NMI vector is pointing there. And so this is now defined as code, and you saw how I did it. I set this as a code start point. There are times where you could need to define a code endpoint. Uh, this is not one of those occasions, but that's that's how you do it. You set a code endpoint and the rest will be treated as sort of unknown. Uh, one of the other things uh, you might want to know is that if you have one of those jump subroutine to print, where the print routine fetches from the stack where it came from and uses that um, to store a zero terminated string, um, then that becomes inline data. Uh, the string becomes inline data. So the jump subroutine to print, and then you would see a, a string, and then suddenly code starts after the, the zero of that zero termination of that string. It's not an uncommon way of, of, of doing sort of inline data for print uh, of, of strings. There you select the start and the end of that string, and you select that as inline data. Um, I'm not going to do that here because that would trash up what we have on the screen now. Uh, so that's, and then if you define it as inline data, then think of it like the, the logic analyzer of the running program. It's skipping that and then started treating everything after the string as something that could potentially also be code. So that's how you do that. Uh, screen mem data uh, and the color memory, all of this would be defined as so single byte binary data. But this is also where you have the opportunity of, of selecting, this is a block of screen codes, this is a block of uh, uh, reversed characters. Here you would have the opportunity of selecting a null terminated string. So if you have something that terminates with a zero, that is a string, you select that. But it's the option is only available if, if the program realizes that you have selected a zero as a lot byte. Otherwise this is not available. So as I've se selected a lot of data here, that option is not available. Um, uh, yeah, I th let's see, screen prefixed with, uh, yeah, yeah, so you could have, uh, one other way of storing strings would be to have the length as the first byte, and then you would have the actual data. So these are options, and that could be, uh, if you have strings limited to up to 256 bytes, you only need one byte of the length, uh, or you would have a very, very long string, and that, then you need all 16, uh, 16 bits to reference that. Uh, and then you also have this dextral character inverted. So if you have a normal string, uh, most of the characters wouldn't have high bit set. But if, you, if you're using that way of, of yeah, 
marking your strings, you can actually save one byte having a zero terminated byte, and you can save by not having the uh, size reference as the starting point. You just set bit seven on the characters. Uh, so if that bit is set, that character is also read and printed, but it's also marked as the end of a string. So that's also one of the things you can do here. Uh, and yes, right. So these were just a few examples of how you can manage uh, around with this, but what you eventually get is some sort of pseudocode. Um, but and if you want to have that into your favorite assembler, then this is also what the program is doing. But let me just show you this. So, uh, oh yeah, I need to save it first. Uh, yeah, that's probably a very good name. Uh, so what you do here, it supports a number of, of uh, assemblers, Turbo Assembler, Acme, CC65 and Merlin. So let's just do this. And uh, so what you do here is you generate uh, a source um, and this is in ACME format and when you do this it runs the assembler and makes a binary compare with a binary source file and if the source you see on the top of the screen co assembles into a binary identical file then there is a high degree of probability that your reassembly has sort of at least addressed a number of the, of the potential issues of reassembly. So this is a good, good sign that it, the output matches the input file. All right. So back here again, uh, you have seen me fiddle a bit with uh, 6502 Bench, one of the three uh, reassemblers I have referenced. It's a very good one. I am doing a project with this uh, as we speak. I'm trying to reverse engineer the uh, retro replay. Uh, this is the only reassembler that could have a shot at us because it's handling the, the very strange way of um, bank selections. Uh, so uh, if you look at cartridges, they would go at hex 2000 bytes long blocks. Um, and uh, the retro replay would have, I, I think it's, it should be eight, but I think it's only seven blocks uh, like that. Um, so, and, and if you try to feed that file into uh, regenerator it would choke it wouldn't be able to handle that and uh, so 6502 bench is doing a really good job at handling what is the internal reference with inside a scope and and what is not so um, yeah at one point in time I might have a working reassembly or retro replay but uh, again don't hold your breath it's not something I do actively it's just something I revert to when I don't have anything more useful to do. I didn't show you the aspects 6502 has of notes, which is a very, um, very rich way of, of denoting uh, like comments on, on lines and, and also making full blocks and making notes in particular places of the source file is also a rather good way of navigating. But because on the left, you would have a list of your notes and, and just clicking on them would give you kind of a a quick access to that particular point in the source file because what you eventually start doing otherwise as you've seen me do during the uh, the reassembly session we just had it was scrolling around uh, looking like having like no clue of where I am or where I'm going but adding the notes is a very good way of, of finding side, sort of placeholder inside the source where you can navigate through so thank you for joining us this week. Uh, that was everything I had. Let's see what we can do next week. So welcome back again on Fairlight TV on Fairlight Friday next Friday. Bye-bye.